It gives me a great privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Ravi Sami, who's the chief of uh, otology and neurotology at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he's going to give us a great lecture today on uh, middle fossa and extended middle fossa. So, Dr. Sami, please go ahead. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Slattery, and thank you, uh, Hussein. It's a pleasure and honor to be here on this. Uh, I got to tell you, when this first started during COVID, I thought this was a brilliant idea, and I've enjoyed listening to different lecturers as they give us their wisdom, and the fact that we can do this not only from uh, this country, but from around the world is wonderful. And there's my email at the bottom there. If you guys have any questions afterward, uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, it's always nice to hear uh, different people's thoughts and opinions. Um, I will start with this quote, especially in the midst of all the challenges we're facing with COVID and, and the business side of medicine. This is from George Merck, who's the founder of Merck Pharmaceuticals. We try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It's not for the prophets. The prophets follow. And if we have remembered that, they've never failed to appear. And I think, uh, you know, Dr. Slatter and I, all the faculty that may be on this truly know this, that the better you take care of your patients, and, and I had an interview last week with Dr. Brackman, if you look at your patients, at your friends, as, as family members, I'm here to take care of them. Uh, none of us will have empty waiting rooms. Uh, people will be always honored to see us. Um, none of us built our career by ourselves. So if I go through, I'm going to see here and Hussein, let me know if you can see kind of this little laser dot. Can you see that? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah. Great. So I want to start here with uh, my mentor during fellowship. I can't believe I finished what? fellowship in 2002 with Dr. Gantz, uh, phenomenal middle fossa surgeon and Jay Rubenstein, who was there at that time as well. And my passion and love for the middle fossa approach, uh, especially for acoustics. And I know Dr. Uh, Gantz gave a lecture earlier uh, on how he deals with uh, Bell's palsy. He is a consummate uh, middle fossa surgeon. Uh, and I was very uh, fortunate to train with him. And while I did a lot of work with the two of them during my time at Iowa, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Penzak and then Dr. Zuccarello because I, uh, North Cincinnati has a very interesting take on skull-based tumors and uh, a lot of cerebrovascular pathology. So Dr. Penzak started here after finishing up with Dr. Glasgow, started working with John too. So they were doing a lot of basilar artery aneurysms and preterocleival meningiomas. Uh, brainstem cavernomas. So this is a program that has done that for a long time. And so I learned kind of a different skill set. How you approach a skull base from a middle fossa approach really depends on the pathology you're seeing. And uh, a lot of collaborators from now Dr. Andalus and Dr. Forbes, fortunate to have phenomenal fellows, uh, Noga Lipschitz, currently Scott Shapiro. Noga just graduated heading back to Israel and then great uh, APPs. Uh, so as a skull base team, as we all know, here's Ali Maines, uh, one of our um, APPs. So here we are talking to a group out of house and uh, here's the namesake of course, right? Bill House, Howard House. Um, and you, if you're a neurotology fellow, really need to read the early articles. What Bill House did is still boggles my mind at times when I look back 50 years ago and look what I think uh, 1959 if I remember correctly was the first middle fossa approach and when you read some of his early papers when he talked about relieving pressure on the cochlear nerve and trying to help with cochlear otosclerosis and then how he figured out to take it to tumors of the facial nerve to vestibular nerve section and then what about doing acoustics? And if it's a larger acoustic, you know, um, how do you remove the uh, superior canal and do a labyrinthectomy from above? Um, these are truly the geniuses. And I think when you look at your own research career and academic career, looking at these papers helps you become a better surgeon as well as um, understand the middle fossa approach even better. 
So I have really worked hard. I think now that I'm uh, almost 20 years out from fellowship, I feel like I'm still continuing to grow as a surgeon and with great residents and fellows and, and collaborators have tried to publish a lot on the middle fossa approach and realize, you know, when we push the envelope where I realize it's not a great approach for it because if you're not careful, you start using it for a lot of different and larger tumors, then you start struggling and you say, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing it, this approach. Uh, and, and historically, partially due to my bias uh, as a fellow at Iowa, we did not do a lot of uh, retrosig approaches. And so for me, I tended to approach things from middle fossa trans labyrinthine route now because the collaborators I work with here at UC will use the retrosig approach for certain tumors. Um, I don't know if someone's, is that my microphone doing that? Or I don't know whose that is. Okay, I think we're okay. So these are our publications from our institution on that. So I'm gonna show some slides that I've borrowed from different talks and different people I've done the talks with. And Dr. Jackler, who's chair of Stanford, of course, um, has his atlas and he's also put this online. So if you go to the Stanford website, there's a lot of this stuff. Um, I don't necessarily use this incision, but you know, however you use the incision, for your middle fossa for a standard approach, whether it's this type of incision or pre auricular incision, um, you know, that's perfectly fine. There are multiple ways to do the incision. And then, you know, when you look at the craniotomy, when we center off the zygomatic root, I typically base mine so that's two centimeters off zygomatic root anterior, two centimeters posterior, or two thirds of it should be above, uh, anterior to the uh, EAC, one third posterior to it. Um, I typically, I know some people use a craniotome. I typically use a four millimeter cutting burr to do mine. And then if I have any concerns, especially as my fellows are learning how to do this, because I do like my fellows knowing how to do the craniotomy on their own. Uh, when we do a certain number of our middle fossa cases, we'll do it with near surgery and they'll do the opening. And then other times um, when I'm doing uh, middle fossa work on my own, I'll typically use the drill. So it teaches the fellows to learn how to do a craniotomy, learn how to, to tack up dura at the end of the case, learn how to elevate the dura off the middle fossil floor. So uh, those are uh, different options and ways to approach it. Hey, Hussein, I don't know if it's your keyboard. I'm still hearing someone's keyboard in the background. Um, no, mute, I, please. I had muted myself. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to mute the other, if it is any other participants. Okay, so. thank you. And then, uh, you know, early on, like if you look at here and how Dr. Jacko describes the craniotomy, I typically will make mine truly rectangular, but you can see kind of an angle here and he does that to avoid air cells. So just be careful as you get closer to the mastoid uh, and don't enter in that because you can't do risk then of course to CSF leak through the air cells. So as soon as the opening's done, I will occlude all opened air cells with bone wax. And then I, once the, you've done a nice job with all the edges of the craniotomy, then elevate the bone flap itself. Uh, I typically will look under that because early on in my career, if I wasn't careful, if I didn't do enough of a job, I'd try to use some, too much force to crack that open. And then um, I'd end up tearing the dura. So I try to make sure underneath, I'll take a freer and elevate the dura off all different portions going superior to inferior on elevation of um, the dura off the bone flap. So the other one that's really helpful for the fellows on this that are learning, if you go with the Iowa head and neck protocols, a lot of the stuff that I've done over the years still is based on what Dr. Gantz and Dr. Rubenstein taught me, you know, with a few changes, depending on the neurosurgeon I may work with here at UC now. So uh, I was taught to use a posteriorly based skin flap and then, uh, for example, I had a patient with a patient or neuroma recently that went all the way from uh, mid IAC all the way out to almost the PES. So I can actually get this incision coming posteriorly behind the ear. And then you have uh, the probe for the ABR or the CNAP. So uh, Alex and I have, uh, he's a dear friend of mine. He's in uh, Lyon. Uh, or actually uh, St. Etienne near Lyon, France. And he and I have given some talks to the European Association of Otology and Neurotology. So I thank him for some of the slides he gave me 
as well. But when you elevate the middle fossa dura, uh, you go from a post to anterior direction, wouldn't it be nice that this is what you saw early on? But none of this, you're trying to uncover this. It's, uh, to me, it's almost like sculpting, sculpting the middle fossa floor. You don't get to see any of that, but that's what you're looking for. So this is what you typically do. I elevate the dura to uh, superior petrosal sinus. Be careful with sigmoid sinus. Don't be too aggressive. Um, I usually use a freer. I'll use any of the, uh, the Penfield retractors that neurosurgery may have on. Uh, my anterior limit, it tends to be frame and spinosum, which is not necessarily shown here, but middle meningeal artery. Uh, and then be very careful. You know, you're going to see a certain number of patients who have natural dehiscences of the superior canal, uh, but typically you don't necessarily see the superior canal. You see the highest point on the middle fossil floor, but the highest point may or may not be the superior canal. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. GSPN, very important. Uh, you don't want to go from an anterior to posterior direction when you elevate because you then risk a vulsing GSPN and a vulsing uh, labyrinthine segment uh, or geniculate. Uh, superior petrosal, uh, very careful with it. I think early on in my career, I was probably more cavalier than I should have been. Try to be very gentle with that. You know, we'll do some transtentorial techniques and we'll take superior petrosal, but there is a rare risk of a venous infarct. So I'm not cavalier with uh, superior petrosal at all. And so this is one of Alex's uh, photos and uh, he doesn't do middle fossas for uh, tumor work, but he'll use it for Bell's palsy or facial nerve decompressions. And you can see just a nice view here uh, of a labyrinthine segment, geniculate, GSPN, and tympanic segment. So the house method, right, the legendary Bill House um, talked about using GSPN, talked about going to geniculate, talked about you know following labyrinthine, I got to tell you, early on in my career, this scared the heck out of me. Um, I don't do not think it's that easy to do. You know, he, clearly he was a master surgeon, and uh, so I don't. I do that now after years of experience with middle fossa, where I, in my mind's eye, I can kind of see where the labyrinthine segment should sit, um, and it's important. What I've noticed is like some of the different methods I'll go over here in a few minutes to talk about how to find IAC, how to follow facial nerve. I've had temporal bone fractures, as many of you have probably had or seen, where the perigeniculate region's a mess and maybe there's just bone fragments getting to the perigeniculate region, region but it actually could be a transection. And so this area can be very challenging. So I will avoid this area until I work more posteriorly and more medially, then come out to where uh, I think the area of uh, normal nerve should be, but that can be hard in the middle of a fracture with granulation tissue, bleeding. Um, this is what I was taught during fellowship. And if you look at the superior semicircular canal and you blue line it, and this is something you got to work on in the temporal bone lab, you have to spend a lot of time at temporal bone lab. So that superior canal is perpendicular to the petrous ridge. And then at a 45 degree angles IAC, What's allowed me to do is now over the years, as I've gotten more experience with the middle fossa approach is I will actually for larger tumors that extend in the posterior fossa, uh, whether it's meningiomas, whether it's a uh, larger uh, vestibular schwannoma, I actually will now even take some oticapsule. So as long as I don't get into the ampulated end of the superior canal, this to me is all free cut posteriorly. Uh, but this is a great way to look at IAC and get to IAC. And then Jackler method, I think a lot of people probably use this, just work medially, because this is the safest area to go and go out laterally. Before I do a middle fossa approach, I not only have the MRI scan, but I'd like having a CT scan just because it tells me, okay, what's the aeration pattern over the IAC? What's the aeration pattern over the superior canal? Uh, you know, it's a thin arcuate eminence, those kinds of things. So this can kind of guide you, because there are times when the IAC is superficial. So while this seems safe, you do risk uh, on a, uh, a low number of patients, uh, a very uh, thin amount of bone overlying the IAC. And I've only had a few cases in my career, maybe a couple uh, where jugular bulb was actually really high. 
And so and one of them actually got into the ball, wasn't ready for that. And uh, I had, didn't have a, a CT scan on that case ahead of time. And so it's nice to be cautious of that. And then you can also bisect the angle from the arc of eminence and GSPN and work there as well. So I think having these in your armamentarium, so to speak, to know, okay, if I'm struggling with one area of this, how do I then go to another area to help me find the anatomy? I think that's incredibly helpful. So this is from Dr. Osana's text. Uh, he's got, as you, many of you know, great text uh, on dissections for otology and neurotology. So this is a left side. And so you have the retract of the middle fossa dura is pulled up, IAC, posterior fossa dura, arc bit eminence, and looks like probably a little bit of hint of a blue line there. GSPN here, and then following it back, there's tympanic segment, and probably a little bit of labyrinthine here. I don't see this closely as I'd like, but um, you end up working on that. There you go, that's a closer up view of that. So now you can see Bill's bar, named after Bill House, uh, labyrinthine segment, genetic ganglion, GSPN, and then Kawasi space. So for Peter Clival meningiomas, uh, I've got a patient, I'm going to do an infratemporal fossa approach. He's got malignancy of the petrous apex. Uh, we're doing that next week. Um, and so working in this area, knowing about carotid. So I will use um, the uh, GSPN uh, and know and look at where carotid is. Uh, as, uh, sometimes we have to decompress carotid as well, depending on the case that we're doing. Sometimes we have to do control of the carotid as well. And then the other thing I've learned over the years that has been helpful, I know Dr. Penzak taught me for him when he first started, he'd actually on some of his cases go mastoid first to help him figure out the anatomy from below um, to help him know where the acicular chain is, for example, depending on what he kind of case he's doing. If you look at how long the tympanic segment is, it's pretty impressive. You know, it's 13 to 15 millimeters, and here's a tympanic from above, incus, malleus, if you look at superior canal, you can see the blue line there. It actually points to the malleus, and that's something that's been pretty reliable from what I've seen. And so in my mind, I know that if I see where this uh, blue line canal is, I can now trace a path to where the malleus should be. And so once again, Bill's bar, cochlear there. All right, so this is back from the Iowa Head and Neck Protocols, uh, one of Dr. Gantz's cases with uh, showing the blue line and early in my career, um, you know, unfortunately entered into the canal. Um, and as soon as I saw that, plugged it uh, with uh, bone wax right away. Um, and you can take a look here. I know it's hard to tell depth on this picture, but sometimes you really have to do a lot of drilling. So that superior canal, that arc of eminence of the canal is not really the arc of eminence of the middle fossil floor. So it's very possible, for example, this bone posteriorly is actually higher than this bone. And so I basically used that method as I was taught to, to find the blue, uh, blue line of the spear canal. And then um, having the middle fossa retractor is uh, very helpful here, of course. Continue to work. And so now I will tend to do a lot more work here posteriorly, especially as my tumor comes into the CPA. You can start seeing some of the IAC there and then behind that. And then I also will take, if you start working uh, via middle fossa and you've not decompressed some of the bone around you, around the IAC, you're gonna struggle because as you're taking out tumor, you're gonna hit the bony walls once you open up dura. And ideally I try not to do that, um, um, try to open up dura and then come back and take the burr out again because that puts you at risk, I think, of injuring the facial nerve. All right, this is another view from the Iowa Head and Neck Protocols. Blue line there, medial frame and labyrinthine segment, geniculate, malleus here, panic segment. Hey, who's saying, can you, uh, I don't know if that's my microphone again or if that's, if you can just mute whoever's on. Yes, I will look into it right now. Thank you. All right, so this is more work, right? You're seeing more and more decompression. And I think this is probably fine if you just have an IAC tumor itself. You can see the posterior fossa dura. Uh, and then this bone itself, I now take out as well. I do, I'm much more aggressive than I used to be. 
It also allows me to find facial nerve into the CPA. So let's say I have a facial nerve neuroma that I didn't know ahead of time was a facial nerve neuroma. Um, then finding seven uh, near the root entry zone, you actually can get a great view of the posterior fossa, believe it or not, when you take all this bone out here. Um, and then I used to, early on in my career, leave the ledge of bone here so it could hold on to the retractor. Now, typically what I do is I'll use the sauna pet. I'll take all this bone out. I actually, once I open up the IAC dura to let CSF egress, I pull the blade out and it allows me to work a little more freely with my hands because while that retractor is obviously needed to get to the porous, um, it can be a challenge sometimes, especially for the fellows when they're learning how to work in this area with the retractor in place. And then you can see here, right? You can see seven and eight there and um, how great a view actually you can get back looking for Iker, for example, and you have more of a view than you realize. <clears throat> All right, so that is the standard middle fossa approach. I do have some additional slides uh, on that. And uh, Sean Stevens, one of our former fellows, just a phenomenal guy. Sean's now at Barrow working with uh, Michael Lawton, a uh, great surgeon as well. And so Sean was doing some work in our lab on, okay, so how do we get better exposure to the posterior fossa? So if you look at a standard middle fossa approach as I've got here written as S middle fossa, I think it's really good for pathology within the temporal bone itself. And that can be extradural, intradural. So that could be just an IAC tumor alone. That could be facial palsy due to temporal bone fracture. That could be facial neur neuroma that doesn't have significant medial extension, petrous apex lesions. Um, I love the middle fossa for vestibular nerve section because you can then see the better separation of eighth nerve fibers for the Meniere's disease patients. Uh, and I'm happier with that than a uh, retrosigmoid approach because the eighth nerve, as we all know, doesn't necessarily have to divide out into its separate components until sometimes in the mid IAC. Uh, standard middle fossa approach is great for CSF leaks and cephaloceles. And uh, I still think in my mind is the gold standard for superior canal dehiscence repair. However, uh, I think there are some patients in whom the transmastoid approach has worked. So I think getting this exposure is perfectly fine. But if you're starting to see any pathology outside the IAC and you look at how much bone there still is going into quasi space, for example, um, this bone is a hindrance if you're trying to get to that pathology at all. So the standard approach, great for an acoustic, standard acoustic in the IAC. Um, great for encephalocele, CSF leaks, um, great for superior canal dehiscence, and then great for things like Bell's palsy that meet criteria from uh, EMG and ENOG. So what Sean did was he then did, uh, took us, I, I don't remember the exact number of bones he had, um, but we looked at the standard post from the IAC to typical dissection um, and when you leave this triangle of bone and if you add that extra three millimeters approximately then that angle you get to the cpa is significant your exposure while it's not a lot of bone and we're all probably taught during our fellowship at some point or during residency that in otology and neurotology every millimeter matters so if you're struggling on a state vasectomy, for example, you know, taking a little more sputum until you see tympanic segment, until you see pyramidal eminence, um, taking that little bit of extra bone makes you not struggle so much. And so it's not just the visualization back into the posterior fossa, for example, but if you want to actually get your instruments there and say, okay, I need to separate uh, a loop of ICA for my tumor, that extra three millimeters adds, adds a great amount of working area, working distance. And uh, so we use this extended middle fossa approach. P stands for a posterior portion of it because that's different than a quasi's approach when you're going anteriorly and found a statistically significant difference in terms of volume of bone removal. 
So we've pushed the envelope to 18 to 20 millimeters. And I know Dr. House and uh, I'm sure Dr. Slattery and some of the other uh, house faculty may have done this as well, but it's a challenge. And I think that there are times when as much as I love this approach, it's my favorite approach in all skull-based surgery. Uh, I do know that there's limitations with it. And uh, if you're not careful, if you overuse it, you know, maybe on cases, some of these cases, just sticking with a trans lab. Um, and if there's nothing uh, much, in, or if there's nothing in the fundus, going retrosigmoid is, is certainly an option as well. But I think we can use it. If I have patients with a tumor like this who actually has really good hearing and wants us to try it, I think this approach uh, allows us to do that. And we've got a series also now that uh, we've not published yet of combined middle fossa and retrosig patients. Not a lot, but a handful of patients who had great hearing, who are musicians, for example. And it's kind of combined in the best of both worlds from the fundus for the middle fossa to the retrosigmoid approach um, and the cerebellopontine angle. So we tried this and um, had pretty good outcomes. Uh, 16 patients had an extended middle fossa for tumors 12 to 20 millimeters in size, gross total resection 93%, one near total, House Brackman one to two and 15 of 16, serviceable hearing in 38%, some hearing in 62%. So. I think it's a nice option for select individuals, but it is a, a big challenge, especially if you have tumors that are bulky into the CPA. So if I have a patient who's got a lot of CPA components, then I, I'm not gonna try to push the envelope, even if they have really good hearing. And if they're younger and want us to try to uh, you know, take tumor out as opposed to radio surgery or observation. So I was trained to use the House Urban Middle Fossil Retractor. Um, I switched over the years now. The retractor I use for my standard approach is um, a uh, fish middle fossil retractor. When I was at UT Southwestern for three years after fellowship, um, that's what they had. And I actually liked that retractor because it has another degree of freedom, has the ability to angle the blade better, but very similar otherwise to the House Urban Retractor. This, however, is not a good retractor for extended middle fossil work because depending on where you're working, especially for example, a brainstem cavernoma, this is meant to give you uh, a view into the IAC and CPA, but not to the brainstem, for example. So I will typically use the retractor set from the neurosurgeons and that could be uh, uh, anywhere from the Greenberg, depending on who I'm working with, to the buddy halo and different systems. I know uh, different neurosurgeons around the country and around the world will use different systems. So clearly we are nowhere near the first to talk about this approach. If you look, and Dr. Kwasi actually spent time here in Cincinnati years ago as a research fellow. Uh, I think his original paper discussed the middle fossa approach uh, for the extended middle fossa approach, Kwasi approach, uh, on four patients who had patients who had basal artery aneurysms, and uh, you know when you look at a cadaveric model such as this one, and you looked at trigeminal nerve, for example, and you see dura, you know it's amazing to see when you take that out of view, all the different uh, cranial nerve anatomy and brainstem anatomy that you can see, uh, and so knowing this approach, practicing it in the uh, Tremper Bone Lab, you know, nothing, as much as it's nice to get into the operating room and practice these cases, you've got to spend hundreds of hours as a neurotology fellow doing this to feel comfortable with it. Because I would say out of all the approaches, out of my friends and colleagues, and Dr. Slattery can correct me if uh, he thinks otherwise, but I feel like this is the approach that most people stop doing first. That um, if you don't keep your skill set up in this, if you get some bad outcomes, it makes you hesitant you don't want to continue doing this approach. Uh, I do not, I apologize. I don't remember where I got this drawing from, but I loved it because one of the things this taught me was um, we worry about all the anatomy where this is the left middle fossil floor. You look at all the anatomy that's there and you realize while there's a lot of dangerous anatomy, there's actually a lot of bone that can be removed with minimal risk to the patient. So look how much bone you have here in Kwasi space. So now I do a lot more bone work, even for my IAC tumors, 
just so I can uh, uh, pull the uh, uh, bundle anteriorly if I need to do dissection without putting a lot of torque or pressure on the facial nerve. And then all this bone is bone I was talking about that you can remove posteriorly. Um, then we've had a few patients, and I'll show you some case presentations where we've actually done the labyrinthectomy from above as well. And so you actually can remove quite a bit of bone. Uh, you can decompress uh, carotid if needed. And I use uh, GSPN to kind of give me a guide of where a carotid should be. There's middle meningeal artery. And then I think about, uh, I've plugged up the station tube from this angle as well and uh, tensor tympani uh, muscle from above as well. So if you think about this in your mind's eye and say, okay, what bone can I remove safely? What structures do I need to avoid? It gives you more safety and confidence than you realize. Um, Dr. Zuccarello is a, not only a phenomenal acoustic neuroma surgeon, he's been my partner uh, on the neurosurgical side for 15 years. He is an amazing uh, uh, intracranial surgeon. He started his neurosurgical uh, time back in the 80s, and he's one of that generation of neurosurgeons that feels comfortable intracranially with tumors, with uh, uh, trauma. He can still do spine cases. Uh, he's also a cerebrovascular surgeon by training and background. So I've noticed how he uses arachnoid. He really likes to use arachnoid to protect the nerve and to protect the vessel. So he's not fearful of ICA. He's not fearful. He's the one that I'll do the basilar artery aneurysms with and brainstem cavernomas. And it's amazing to see him do that pathology because that's not what we typically think about as neurotologists. And so he's the one that uh, showed me how to use the ultrasonic aspirator. And I think it's been an amazing training tool, not only for me, but for my fellows as well. So if they're struggling, if they're worried, the drill is dangerous, as we all know. If you lose control of your drill and you, and you punch through dura, if you're pressing too hard, then you risk spooling of neurovascular structures around the drill, which can be traveling you know, 30, 40, 50,000 RPM or greater. So I first started using this um, just in a cadaveric model and tried it and liked it. And then uh, he used it for um, um, clinoid removal uh, for aneurysms. Uh, and then we went from that to, uh, we used it for uh, other approaches, translabs, retrosig. And I think it's been really helpful for the middle foster approach in particular. Um, in his lab, one of the things that we did with uh, one of his fellows, um, and the study is not published yet, but hopefully will be in the near future, they took um, five whole heads, did 10 temporal craniotomies. We basically quantified these or called these different things. We call them sequential modular extensions from an anterior uh, petrosectomy to a standard IAC exposure, which is uh, the s middle fossa MCF approach posterior petrosectomy, and then if we include labyrinthectomy. Uh, frameless stereotaxis CT was used, and then we used brain lab software to help us decide, you know, or look at how much bone was removed. So this is off the cadaveric model after dissection is done, and then that's how, what the ghosting looks like. Um, so you can see, you can calculate the amount of bone that's uh, actually removed, the volume of bone that's removed. So if you did, for example, with this on the right side here, if you did a quasis approach alone and you did approximately 1.3 cubic centimeters of bone removal, you can see that little bit of bone, um, which is more than you realize, increases the working area quite a bit. So your instruments can actually uh, come into that area and work uh, much better than uh, otherwise. And that's the uh, bone removal that we have uh, diagrammed there. And then uh, what is the bone removal of just the IAC alone? It's not a lot of bone when you look at it, 0.3 cubic centimeters. But if you combine that with the anterior pretrasectomy, the Kawasi's approach, now you have a much greater amount of bone removed. And then now if you did a posterior pretrasectomy and the bony removal is 4.3 cubic centimeters, but the amount of uh, working area is now 67 square millimeters. So once again, the ability to get your hands in there, remove pathology grow, goes significantly. And if you needed to do a labyrinthectomy for whatever reason from above, you can see how much bone is removed quite a bit, seven cubic centimeters, almost 82 square centimeters. 
And so that diagram, this is from our lab, you can see cranial nerve three. We've done this on a few patients in the OR as well. We actually were able to see from this approach to the foramen magnum, believe it or not. So it's amazing how much room you get. Now, the one caveat I would say is, and I learned this the hard way on a patient who ended up with a TIA, is we're used to doing a lot of middle fossil work with the retractors on dura, but once the dura is gone, you risk ischemia to the temporal lobe. So just be cognizant of that. So you see cranial nerve, you see fourth, fifth, seventh and eighth there, hyca, lower cranial nerves. So this view is really, really impressive. So depending on, for example, a Petri Clival meningioma, which is not gonna be the same, of course, as an acoustic in terms of location, your view is really, really impressive. So what have we used the middle fossa approach for? Extended ones. Here's a basal artery aneurysm there. This is a brainstem cavernoma, pretrochlival meningioma. And then you can see basal artery here. This person had an epidermoid. And um, this part here, what I've noticed with the retrosigmoid, um, where you can be fine in the CPA, the area ventral to the brainstem is not easy to get to from a retrosig approach. So if you have a patient like this who came in with a headache with really good hearing and you find out it's a large epidermal in a young patient, um, that's why we ended up doing the extended middle fossa approach on her. And I think this is the last case that I have. I, I have a video that I can show you and then uh, we can open it up for questions. And so this is one of my favorite cases that, you know, I think Mario has pushed my skill set and envelope um, and understanding of the temporal bone. And I think I've done the same for him and working with great colleagues in neurosurgery, you know, we do have uh, an ability to improve outcomes for our patients. So this is a patient who was seen elsewhere as NF2 um, and uh, partial resection or had subtotal resection. You can see the back graph from the prior surgery. Um, and the right sigmoid sinus was the functional sigmoid sinus. So we did not know how to deal with, these are lower cranial nerve tumors here. This is her acoustic. She was out with both her facial nerve and her hearing, and she has NF2 uh, in her 30s. She comes in with her aunt. She has uh, two sons. She's deaf, she's blind, and she communicates by finger spelling uh, with her aunt. And her aunt has to do everything for her. And so when Mario first told me, he said, why don't we do an extended middle fossa approach on this? It didn't make sense to me. Her uh, facial nerve was already out. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons he brought that up. And so what we did was we took the tumor, this tumor out from above and put an ABI in her. Um, and you can see this is the amount of bone removal, you know, a ton of bone removal. It was nice with this approach was I didn't touch sigmoid at all, right? Because you have to remember, anytime you get close to sigmoid, even if you do not damage sigmoid sinus at all, it doesn't matter whether it's translab or retrosigmoid approach, you still risk a clot occurring. And in a patient with a single-sided functional sigmoid sinus, um, the risk of death and vascular catastrophe is immense. And you can see the paddle of the ABI there and the lateral scanogram view showing ABI. And so, um, you know, I know Dr. Slattery talked about NF2 and ABIs and, and, you know, the amount of experience he has is phenomenal with the ABI. Uh, I'm just happy that she has sound awareness now. And um, we've now done, I think, either one or two other ABI cases from extended middle fossa approach, uh, just to see it, what it'd work, what it'd do, would it give us better outcomes or not. And uh, it's nice and pushy envelope, uh, but at the same time, you look at a slide like this and you say, okay, you know, um, don't take this surgery for granted. Don't take it lightly. Anyone doing skull-based surgery will have all these complications. I don't care if it's middle fossa, retrosig, translab, transotic, whatever you're doing. And so thank God no uh, surgical mortality, but have had uh, significant uh, complications and, and uh, you know, it tempers your enthusiasm at times but you want to tailor the approach to the patient 
and his or her pathology and hearing and cranial nerve status. So uh, I've got a video, uh, Hussein, I'm happy to start answering questions. It's right at uh, 1040 Eastern time. And then as I show the video, um, we can uh, talk about uh, you know, some of this. And Dr. Slatter, you'd love to hear his points on the middle fossa as well as anyone else um, uh, on here as well. And final quote, uh, you need to learn from your patients. Medical education begins with the patient, continues with the patient, and ends with the patient. Sir William Osler, and that's certainly true, one of the great uh, medical minds of uh, early modern medicine. All right, so I think this should be playing, and, and uh, thanks to Dr. Zuccarello, Sean Stevens, and Charles Poon, who was a med student here with us, or a grad student here with us who did this video. So hopefully I can get this to work. Oops, okay. all right. So this turned out to be a patient nerve neuroma. Um, this is with videos on the YouTube channel, CI Surgeon. And Charlie did an amazing job uh, putting timestamps at each part. And you can see the tumor there on the left-hand side. It's because of this case, if I remember correctly, I started doing more and more ahead of time looking at enogs and you know a lot of times historically i would just look at audio and the abr depicts a middle cranial fossa and uh, or now MCF i approach. also will do enox the surgeon is seated at the top of the patient's patient head. nerve neuroma and i know there's reports i remember seeing a series from dr brackman years ago on that that you can run into the tumors that you think are acoustic standard uh, acoustic or vestibular one of those turn out to be patient nerve neuromas instead so i see has been skeletonized caloric created in 180 degrees now just to make sure that i know ahead of time the superior semicircular canal is visible to the left twitching has been gray lined palsy using the fish method the Charlie did a nice job right. ghosting and putting a portion of the labyrinth segment of the facial nerve has been decompressed when he made this video A crab tree pick so, is used to fully uh, identify the transition between look eyes at this and dura, video now, the labyrinthine segment funny when of facial nerve, own work, and remnant bone. And you say, what would you have done differently? And I look at this, and I still think some a of the bone I left uh, is used to further decompress here, the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve out a way to, show to that. the geniculate ganglion. I guess it won't let me show on off my iPad. I still would have probably... Oh, there it is. Okay. I would have taken a little more bone here. I think now... I still realize that every time I feel like I've taken enough bone, 10 to I still take more bone. RPM. I work another to five, ten minutes bony overhang and having that bone there, uh, margin. taking bone out of glossies, all that really does help as in it terms does of moving tolerate any tumor, getting your instruments in and out because our tumor, our instruments are rigid, the, superior the bone is rigid. Of the canal. If one does um, enter one the superior of the things I tried to teach my fellows, the drill is to be applied not an intelligent tool. You're the With one that brings in the intelligence. Opening so of the do not using go at 75,000 RPM. This typically With your begins burst. posterior you know, when to you're the doing a middle fossa approach, I want to see you of slow your bird down. Be this very step is conducted cautiously. Um, I like opening up the posterior fossa dura, boundary. letting out the egress the of CSF. Is of you have to be very careful that you don't get a loop of ICA in that. That's very dangerous, as you can imagine. Uh, that is threatening. CSF so I try to look at and see where I can is. Typically, this allows the tumors one push to ICA out. You, know, you can't can have loops of ICA going into the IAC, of While course. CSF flows from um, the system, we've struggled with the CNAP electrode. Cochlear nerve uh, action the company's not making any more, or so we've kind of had to jury rig and use our own by the CNAPs. And I think Dr. Dan said he's had the same problem. I've talked about Quave as well. And the company, for whatever reason, is not making right now. In other words, um, this is a rapid I like that over the ABR response. because it like is a near field the response. Far field response. I like having gel foam or thrombin available. As you can see, we remove the retractor the blade electrode has the because once I remove that bone superior to the IAC, to the and I now the have the ability to do dynamic retraction with my suction. path of tumor dissection. <clears throat> it is protected and held in place with a small well, piece of gel. Once that CNAP electrode is in place, we need wax. I use bone wax or the IAC dura is gently uh, dissected gel foam free from the position for moving. The eighth cranial nerve is visible medially in the All IAC. All right, you can see uh, normal nerve into the CPA. P 
peeling the dura off as gently, as carefully, and as slowly as possible. The Pras probe is utilized to using the Pras lead probe. You know, something I was taught by Mario uh, was he actually likes to use the Pras likes the cochlear nerve for dissection. Facial nerve is also because I'd always use my own instruments. You know, the favorite instrument of every Iowa fellow is the, laterally at the, the McCabe flat knife. So I used to use that lock or two more. Now, you know, I'll dissect with the Pras. He's masterful. Mario's masterful with that. Indicating that this and was so a I'll use that uh, for a dissection as well. Tumor to bulk and continue. And going between different instruments, I think crab tree is a wonderful instrument. Moving after for, segments are tested with the Pras. Uh, pulling probe. normal nerves anteriorly and pulling the tumor uh, posteriorly. A small piece of tumor is sent to pathology. Setting off a piece of uh, tumor to pathology, diagnosis. although we typically should know ahead of time that it is truly a uh, vestibular schwannoma. Having different instruments available, uh, using micro scissors to debulk tumor. After debulking a portion of the tumor, uh, the occasionally we'll the use the sauna pet. So not only is it good for bone removal, you can use it. I think many of the people who are maybe faculty on this or fellows may have used it for tumor work as well. It's a nice instrument, the Barracuda tip. Um, the newer Sonopet in particular is smaller and you're more able to get it uh, to work this in this tumor area. tumor is sequentially debulked with straight microforceps. And, and you got it debulk, got Periodically debulk taking into account the path of the fissure and much space as lateral you can. to it. The PRAS probe is utilized to determine what segments of tumor are safe to remove. Be careful as you're taking some of this tumor, tumor here. Behind, given that if you're not careful, you, you pull too immediately. You know, you risk a bulging nerve in this direction as well as the other direction. Gel foam so if we have any concerns the with the CNAP, the CNAP probe or ABR, amplitude and we'll stop. Changes. We'll uh, use uh, of the surrounding middle gel foam with diluted the pavarin. Uh, just give it a little bit of time. Gel foam's removed from the um, that tumor that was left along seven was facial nerve tumor, and so to not have a uh, risk of facial palsy, the CPA cistern is copiously uh, left that bit of tumor along the seven, and then, uh, you know, irrigating out posterior fossa, uh, making sure there's not a hematoma there. And then I used to use uh, fat years ago, uh, and I know some people still do. I'll just take a piece of temporalis muscle and use that to plug into the defect because it's there and you don't have to have it and uh, is used to separate incision. Uh, labyrinthine segment, I make sure I decompress at the time to find seven. Bone wax. And then to finish up, uh, we'll take, uh, we'll have started Finally, with temporalis fascia and place that along the middle fascia fascia floor, make sure all the beginning of the air cells is placed along the are included with bone wax. To seal fiber glue is then We'll use sometimes dura repair as well on the middle fossa floor. So that is it. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope this was beneficial to people watching this and I'm, I'll open it up to any questions. And once again, thank you to Dr. Sl Slattery and thank you to Hussein for allowing me to present.